through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows ekphrastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin. I'm Spencer, and today I'm joined by Colin Trevorrow. Pronouncing that right? Trevorrow. 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 See, I, you know, I always like last names to be right, so I'm very picky about that. Trevorrow. Now I'm a dick for correcting. No, I like the pizzazz of it, if anything. It's got more pizzazz (laughs) than Trevorrow. Who cares about that name? All right. Trevorrow. Now that's that's something to be said. You are the director and producer of Safety Not Guaranteed, Mm -hmm. currently slotted at number two on my favorite films so far this year. Uh, Just what was number, just so we know. Jeff, who lives at home. Okay, so you're just like it's a Duplassy Duplass. kind of yeah, yeah. and it wasn't even it's not even like it was going into that where it's like every Duplass film is a right. musty film, but it's a good year for him. Yeah, it's good. It's very it's so much stuff even still to come out. Safety not guaranteed. Uh, I went into it South by Southwest because friend of the podcast Lacey Levitt was one of the producers on it. It was filmed in the <clears throat> Seattle area, which was interesting to me. I guess we should start there actually because that was one of my first questions. What exactly made you guys film it in Seattle? I, I believe the original story was based somewhere in Portland or something mm-hmm. with the guy who created the note. What made you guys decide to come to Seattle, though? Because, I mean, it's great for our town, but you right. guys are New York filmmakers, I believe. Kind of. We don't really – we're sort of homeless filmmakers. We, uh, <laughs> you know, It was originally set – the script was originally set in North Carolina. Uh, and Derek is is from Florida, so he is he gave it a very southern feel. Uh, the the organ connection is is from Backwoods Home Magazine, which is where mm-hmm. the ad was originally published, uh, and so that's that's the source of it. Uh, and I wanted to shoot in Washington just because I think it's a beautiful state, and I think it has certain magical qualities to it uh, in in the way that it looks and, and feels, and I, and I love the light here, and and so all of those reasons uh, actually worked very well with some practical reasons why we wanted to shoot here, which is that uh, Mark had a great relationship with Ben Kasulke, mm. and uh, Ben has a crew of people here, uh, you know, via Lacey and, and Mel Eslin, and uh, just this whole group that's just a giant family, and so being able to shoot with people who knew each other that well and, and knew each other's language and could speak it uh, allowed us to move very quickly. And we you know we shot the movie in 24 days in, in 30 locations, and so wow, we were just constantly amazing, yeah. jamming all the time, yeah. And that's that's a good point to mention as well, because, you know, Mark Duplass is one of the stars of the film. What exactly, you know, you look at, and this is totally based upon, like, IMDb. You look at your IMDb, and it basically goes, you know, 2004 to 2012. So how exact, what exactly took place during that period, and how did you go about, you know, getting this on the radar of, say, Mark Duplass and everyone else involved? Because it, it's 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 kind of, in some ways, feels like going zero to 60 right. in terms of filmmaking. Uh, I was in prison for a while, and I, that's not, <laughs> not true. I've heard uh, that story before, actually. You'd be surprised. Uh, I uh, No, what I, where those years went uh, was I started writing uh, screenplays for studio films mm. and you, when you do that your IMDB looks like a giant wasteland because those films don't actually get made and so there's I, a lot of development hell stuff going yeah on and sure. so you know I, I was making a living and, and I wrote for I wrote for a lot of different studios and, and a lot of them were originals so I was able to build things from scratch mm-hmm. and, and I sold a couple specs and uh, so that you know, and that's a, that is a good life and you can, you can, it's going to be very rewarding. But, uh, for me, I, I just, I always, not only did I always want to direct it, I just, I felt like I, I needed to do something. Derek and I together, Derek Connolly, who, who wrote this screenplay, uh, I was writing both alone and then, and then with him and we just felt like we needed something to, to jumpstart the process and, and put us in a position where we could really be creating things that people would actually see. So how does, how do you guys get it? You know, I'm sure Mark Duplass gets, hundreds of scripts a year how do you how do you get it on his radar and then you know once you're even on his radar how do you sort of separate yourself i mean the story itself is very interesting and very creative but it feels like i mean you you, as you said you you write there are people like you who are writing scripts all the time in hollywood and there's only say a fraction of that stuff that actually gets made how do you go about doing it did you target mark uh, early on, was that something that serendipitously occurred? Like- we well, we went to him with it. So we, uh, what we had was Aubrey and Jake, 
and uh, the script and the source material and me directing and Derek and and we took that package and because uh, Mark and I at the time were at the same agency uh, and so and but if, even if we hadn't been uh, they're actually very uh, accessible uh, there's uh, a great producer named Stephanie Langhoff who works for Duplass Brothers Productions and and reads all of those scripts that come in and and knows their tastes well enough that she was able to say Mark you got to read this one and uh, so that's really what happened is, is Stephanie brought it to him and he read it and he fell in love with it just in the, in the way that I had when I first read it and uh, he came on uh, with his brother as an executive producer first uh, and then over over the preceding month uh, as we were looking for uh, the perfect Kenneth we started to realize he you might know, be a- this might be kind of cool so in terms of, you know, actors, you mentioned Aubrey Plaza, you mentioned Mark Duplass, uh, Jake Johnson, all very talented actors. What was it like in terms of improvising versus sticking to the script? Because all of those people are very talented improvisers as well as just straight up actors. Did you give them freedom to play with the script as it was written or did you try and stick pretty close to what you had on the page how did how did that all work out ultimately uh we we did shoot the script but i would always look for something more uh not necessarily in comedy we didn't uh do a lot of joke offs and then we weren't really trying to reach uh for those kind of moments because not only was the comedy great as written but uh you know we really wanted a very organic feel to the movie and and so with the amount of time we had i had to be very selective in where i was going to choose to to let them improvise at all because we couldn't do it all the time and so i chose we're going to do this during during the more emotional scenes the more dramatic scenes Mm -hmm. and because i know that you know mark mark's not a comedy improviser he's actually a dramatic improviser and that's what those movies are and why i think well they're so naturalistic and great you know they they have they don't have a script they have a an outline they have a a a structure that they know they're going to adhere to and then they whatever happens honestly in that moment they build on it and they they turn it into a scene and so i wanted to take advantage of, of where his strengths are uh, and uh, it, but you know Aubrey and Jake while I know they can improvise comedically very well are also they're just great actors uh, fundamentally and so putting them in scenarios where they you know Jake could lead uh, a scene that that wasn't finished you know that that scene where that where he and and Arnau are uh are in the in the lobby and he puts his sunglasses on and pops his collar up and you know that was that scene wasn't complete and so we were able to say look like you know we know it needs to happen here but let's let's find that next level a moment of brilliance for sure what was it like in terms of working with mark and jay you know they are accomplished directors as you had mentioned did you did you consult them as you were doing it because this is probably the biggest production you would directed at this point so far the at only least. yeah so <laughs> uh, did you feel pressure to perform in front of them because they're so accomplished or did you like how did that work because it seems like I, I, I've definitely been around films where you know it there is that element of too many cooks getting involved in, in the directing and it, everything came out phenomenally here, so I'm just right. wondering how you struck that balance in terms of them, you know, yeah. producing versus not getting too micromanaging on top of you, etc. Yeah, I never felt that there was any micromanaging uh, at all, and and I I, I did actually have uh, a lot of freedom to to run that set, and and I didn't feel like Mark was constantly you know looking over my shoulder or anything <laughs> like that. Uh, he what he did do that was great uh, is you know he. He did trust me, and he and he saw that I I knew very clearly what I wanted, and and yet he knew, you know, based on our conversations and just how we were working together, that I was going to give him the room to, as an actor, get to where he needed to go. Uh, and so, anytime that there was any kind of conversation of, you know, is something not going as well as we wanted to, it would always be, you know, are you getting enough time to do what you need to do? Like, are are we are we letting this breathe enough? And he was able to make decisions. I know internally he's directing himself. And he, he's able to make choices that could get us there faster. And he would also be able to do things like, you know, ask Aubrey a question that wasn't in the script that as the character that might lead us to a great moment. And, and a good example of that is when he asks her what her favorite song is. And she says, over the rainbow. And and that was a, an unexpected question and an unexpected answer for all of us. And it's her real answer. Uh, and so you get to not only see a little bit inside of Darius, but you even see a little bit inside of Aubrey Plaza. And, well, in that moment. And that's a great a great thing to raise because this is really her I mean theatrical 
debut in terms of leading a film. Mm -hmm. I mean, she'd been in, you know, Funny People and films like that. But this is really putting Aubrey Plaza on display as a lead actress. And I thought that was a very interesting selection of an actress and a, I mean, ultimately a wonderful choice. How did you guys ultimately, you know, settle on picking her for that role because you know it feels like they're I mean you could always throw like oh Zoe Deschanel she's quirky you know she's the go-to indie actress but to actually sort of step outside of that and think of somebody basically new Mm -hmm. to this arena was an interesting choice what led you to Aubrey Plaza and how did you ultimately you know decide she was the right fit uh well the it was actually written for her. Derek had her in mind the whole time. And I had met her a couple times before then. And that was part of, you know, what put her in his mind is I was, I, I was hanging out with her in, uh, Montreal because it's close to where I live. And so I'd go up for the Montreal Comedy Festival and she'd come up there to do stand up as she was, uh, promoting funny people. And, uh, so I, I, and I wrote to Derek and he was in North Carolina. I said, Oh, you know, I met Aubrey Plaza tonight and she's cool. And it just kind of sparked this thing. He's like, that's who it is. It's Aubrey Plaza. And, um, you know, as far as and I, but I think that you know the choosing of of you know the indie it girl uh, in an indie movie I think is a mistake because the indie it girl is created because somebody else made a daring choice two movies ago and once you start trying to you know let's have Ellen Page play another version of Juno you know that character is iconic because it was so new and original and fresh and that's what indie movies are for is to introduce new people and so with all these actors you know Mark hasn't played a role like this ever uh, and if you know if you took all of his movie directing off the map he's almost unknown as a film actor uh, you know, I mean, he's on the league, but like, what else have you really seen him in outside of Hump Day and his own? You know, before this year. To yeah, be before, fair, before this year, now, this year like, he's had like eight films. I know. Come yeah, out. yeah. Well, I'd like say, if, yeah, if you uh, <laughs> if you see one movie this year, it's uh, gonna have yeah, Mark Duplass. It's gonna have Mark Duplass in it. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I think that's almost the responsibility of, of indie filmmakers is to to be a little brave and take the risk and go out and find who's going to be the the next you know, new voice. That's kind of an interesting point in terms of, you know, it's absolutely logical that indie films are a place for experimentation to try new things, try new people, etc. But in some ways, they do kind of, there is a conservative sort of perspective to indie films that is the problem with the Hollywood system in a lot of people's opinion, you know, always putting the same people in the same roles. And you're right, you know, Ellen Page or Zoe Deschanel are always cast in those sort of, Mikey, Michael Sarah, you know, these people. Did Did you guys worry at all when you were putting this together being like this is this is our moment you know we got we got to make sure this one's a slam dunk so that we can do that next one or did you just sort of look and go we're going to lay everything out on the table you know whether we succeed or we fail this is going to be our vision through and through it's kind of both it was more like this is our moment we got to kill this thing and so therefore we will lay everything out on the table and and you know i didn't I, I that you're conscious of that and especially in, in putting together a cast we knew there was a ceiling to how much money we could get for the movie with that cast and we were told very clearly look you know, Aubrey Plaza Jake Johnson and you know whomever you find for Kenneth you know unless it's some ridiculous huge movie star you're not getting more than a million dollars for this no way and people were saying we're going to get 200,000 it was nothing we ended up getting you know less than a million dollars but but enough that we could make the movie it's sort of funny though you think about like if this were made say a year from now or two years from now to get that same cast would probably be what five million dollars ten million dollar film like it's well yeah and that that takes a certain amount of foresight you know it's it's you know you buy some like shitty house that that you know no one can understand how this house can ever be good but like you it's it's the neighborhood flips and then suddenly you look brilliant yeah exactly well i bought yeah all these all these people are like you know we bought google in in 1999 (laughs) well it's it's, it, it worked out perfectly for you guys uh, I know you guys had a different ending when you premiered at Sundance that you've since changed with South by Southwest, I believe, going forward, which was the original ending you guys had in mind. Not uh, – you're close. We actually – we had an ending before Sundance, and we changed it before okay. Sundance. So no one – we never screened it with, with any the other ending. ending. This is the exact same movie that screened at okay. Sundance. So my, my question is sort of even beyond that in mm-hmm. terms of – this is the ending you guys had all along, which is a great ending I love. But was there any sort of reason that you thought about using the original ending? Was there, was it, what, what led you guys to that in the first place and what made you decide to step back from it? And we don't even need to explain yeah, what the ending is, is right? so we can avoid I, that. I think what I'll say, in order to avoid it, I'll just say that, you know, the original ending, the, the, 
the goal of the original ending was for the film to be real and based in reality mm-hmm. and and the the whole film is and there's nothing that really happens in the movie that sure. can't happen right uh and you know we reached a point where we felt like we'd earned uh by and we had to watch the movie to know uh whether we'd earned it and uh, there was a point where i felt you know i feel like we can do something here that we you know some people might be like, like this and just like you know laugh at us to a certain extent and i i felt like it was a worthwhile risk and I also felt like it was what I knew it was what I wanted as an audience mm-hmm. member, it was what I wanted as a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. And it was this feeling of, God, you know, we haven't, we've not played by a single rule from start to finish on this thing. Like, why start now? Let's just like burn the guitar and kick the amp over and <laughs> drop the mic that's, and that's walk pretty, off stage. That's pretty awesome. You know, you talk about, and this is, this is a good, this is a good point as well. This is a film fundamentally sort of that has time travel in the background. I, I, I definitely think it's sort of, you know, in some ways a MacGuffin, a means to an end, which I really like. But time travel is one of those things that you could, you could go two dramatically different directions. You could sort of keep it real or you should, you could sort of go, you know, uh, back to the future primer, make it like, a, a full-blown element. How did you sort of balance that in terms of the film? Because you you, you decided to go real, as you said. How, how, how did you know when you were pushing that boundary of like, okay, this is this is venturing into that realm of not being real, or like it's, it's as a topic. It seems like you could say that at any point. Like mm-hmm. some people might be like, "Oh, time travel—that's bullshit." Like, what the hell? This whole thing is fiction. Like, right. so, uh, you know, that is true. And I think that even in this version, you could say, "Well, this whole thing is bullshit." <laughs> and just like, "Why?" Well, about you any totally film say that about any film for sure. Uh, you know, in the end, like you know, we wanted it to be about you know the emotional needs that that time travel satisfies in all of us, and why we're you know what it does for us, why we're so attracted to it, and and I think that. That, you know, in Jake's story, which is not a literal time travel story, it's it's really right. more of a metaphorical one and, and a thematic one. And and when you're and, and you know, I understand the criticism of, of some people who don't even understand why his character story is in the movie and feel like it has nothing to do with anything. Ooh, I disagree. I, with I that. totally disagree. Yeah, with that. like I, th- I think the the balance between the two stories is what makes the film so beautiful. Actually, well, thank you. And that, that's you know, that was it, it was intentional. So if it was what we were trying to do. So uh, you know, whether whether we succeed or fail. You know, we'll find out. Uh, but you know, I felt like ultimately, you know, we wanted the movie to not rely on whether or not the time travel was real or not. And by the time you get to the end, you know, I don't think that the answer to that question is what is the most satisfying emotionally as far as what you've seen. What's most satisfying is that, you know, Aubrey Plaza chooses to to sort of shed this this cynicism and and believe in something and, and sort of make herself vulnerable. And, and, well, and that was the thing, you know, I argued and some people have sort of said, you know, it, it depends. And I've sort of in retrospect gone back and rethought it. But uh, people who had seen the original ending, you know, I, I was sort of in the mindset and I talked to people in South by West, South by Southwest and I said, you know, I don't even know if the original ending were there, if it would really change how I feel so much about the film. I mean, it might, in retrospect, thinking about it, it might a little bit. But to me, it was the journey that they went on to get there that I found the most interesting about the film. You know, the ending was just sort right. of like the cherry on the top of the cake. I don't know who these people are who you say have seen the original. There's well, like they, eight I, th- oh, I think they were like oh, Jake. worked for us. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, like yeah. people like that. Who's <laughs> right. Jake and you know maybe Aubrey and Mark or whoever. Aubrey had never seen the movie at all. Okay, so, yeah, it might okay, have been, so probably I, Mark. it was definitely it was definitely Mark. Jake at the very least. Yeah. I remember that. But I mean, do you think the ending really? When you look at the film, is is a dramatic difference, or do you think it is a journey-driven film? It is a journey. To, look, the ending does change everything about what you've seen up to that point. So it it does it it it, it obviously like has a it, a massive effect on the film. But we're but not talking like M Night Shyamalan. No, like, no, oh, he, the they were dead there. the whole time. <laughs> I can't is, believe no, is they're like, in some small park. No. <laughs> and it's not even like you can't even really call it a twist. It's not a twist because no. you know, a twist. The option of the twist is is you know not on the table right and where's this like it's on the table yeah <laughs> you know yeah. and and i think that it's you know for us the reason why i part, maybe one of the reasons why i think it it works is that it, it is so unsupported mm-hmm. over the course of the film and it's not really set up and in a way that it traditionally would be and so i think that because you're focused so much on these characters and what they're going through and and the thematic elements of the movie you're you can't
can't imagine in, in your wildest dreams that we would do anything like that because it's just not there. And, you know, sort of my perspective in terms of like saying, you know, I, as I say, I've sort of thought about it a little bit more and said, yeah, you know, it probably changed it a little bit. But like Jake, Jake's relationship was a Karen. Karen, yeah. Karen. Karen. Like their relationship really is in a large part separate from the end of the movie. And I think that, you know, that element wouldn't change necessarily no. with the end. And I think that's still sort of beautiful. Well, well there, you know, their, their arc actually ends at the end of the second act, which in screenwriting is you just don't do that. I mean, you're not going to, I mean, we, we pretty much finished their story, uh, on I that night. Morals, and, yeah. you know, and the, but the third act is really focused pretty solely on the, the, propulsion forward to, right. to find out the answer to this question. Yeah. I do think that, you know, Jake does have a moment at the end that's, that's you know, that's pretty iconic that oh, I think yeah. for oh, me uh, is like well, the, oh, I, I, we I, won't I, say I, it, yeah, but like, absolutely that's, that is the, the culmination of his character and what he's embracing there, I think, and what he's supporting to it me. De- it definitely is a nice punctuation mark yeah. at the end of the movie, regardless of what you think of it. Uh, so you've got this great film, you know, it's coming out in theaters. What websites, Twitters, what what can people find more information about this? Because, I, I mean, it's going to be released nationwide, I believe. Yes. And that's, what, June? Two weeks from now. So June 8th, it's going to be in uh, New York, Seattle, Portland, and Los Angeles. And then the week after, we'll, we go to like 15 cities, San Francisco and Chicago and Washington, D.C., and it keeps opening uh, wider. And uh, website, is it just like Safety Not Guaranteed? Uh, safety Not Guaranteed movie, okay. I believe. And then the Twitter is... Uh, SNG movie. Yeah, at SNG movie, I, I think, is Twitter. Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. You. Yeah. Other pe- people are going to want to know more about what you're doing next after this sure. movie. What is next for you? And uh, where can more people find more information about you? I, there's not a lot of information I have because of the you know the the weird years in the wilderness. <laughs> like, I don't, you know, I, go on the Wikipedia, yeah, just add some I, stuff. Uh, you know, I should, I should make some stuff up. Yeah. I, uh, you're a writer. Come on, I'm a writer. Uh, no, you know, I uh, I live in Vermont, and uh, I I'm having another baby soon, which I'm excited wow. about. Yeah. Uh, you know, cool personal stuff. But uh, as far as like you know, professional life, uh, I there I, I can't speak with any specificity as to what the next thing will be Uh, there 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 are amazing opportunities that have arisen as a result of this uh and uh one of them i will say will will probably uh, create a great deal of ire against me on the internet when people find out what it is uh and so i I just want to say in advance that i that i promise you uh, for all of those who like who love the uh the mythology that i will be tackling uh i i trust that i love it as much as you do uh and 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 i will i will uh i will respect it uh and hopefully you know make it not suck and do you have you do have a twitter was it Colin i do Tr- yeah Chavarro. Colin Chavarro. it's on my it's like my yeah. name and then I'm, I'm not very good anything? at that it's not, i mean i i can't recommend my twitter it's not that i'm, I'm trying i'm trying I'm, I'm no country for old men with this stuff i'm, uh, I'm uh, you know you're, you're good you're good you're get, you'll get there I'm we'll working, get there i'm working yeah. on it man um anyway i love the film uh check out more interviews at mcguffinpodcast.com and check out safety not guaranteed in theaters